Okay, well, hello everyone and welcome. Thank you for joining us in our discussion today with Professor Kath Sunstein on the application of behavioral science in the UN context in particular. Uh, my name is Mary McLennan and I lead what's called the UN Behavioral Science Group, which is an initiative of the UN Innovation Network. Essentially, what we aim to do is to bring together more than uh, 600 colleagues from across the system, ranging from across 40 UN entities and 60 countries. So quite a bit of breadth and depth to the group. And we aim to promote the application of behavioral science in a variety of ways. So I lead this group alongside my colleague, Johanna Joachim, who runs the UN Innovation Network more broadly. Okay, so in terms of, um, if you've been engaged with the Behavioral Science Week, I'm sure you've heard about these, uh, these points already, but just to, to mention it here as well. So uh, if you want to engage in the work, uh, behavioral science work at the UN, we ask that you do this in three key ways. So first, to read the UN Secretary General's guidance note on behavioral science, which was launched on Monday. Um, Cass was also there at the launch, gave some remarks. Uh, also, the UN Behavioral Science Report, which outlines the experiences of 25 UN entities applying behavioral science. So um, lots to read if you want more detail. Secondly, join the UN Behavioral Science Group. Uh, welcome to any UN colleague can join, no matter level of expertise. And also colleagues outside the UN can, can join in an observer role. Uh, we have colleagues from governments, international organizations, academia, the private sector, civil society, and many other areas as well. And lastly, follow us on Twitter. So uh, we will be sharing uh, work from across the UN uh, on those accounts. So if you follow them, you can keep up to date with us there. Uh, okay, so now just a little bit about the week. So we're coming to the end of UN Behavioral Science Week. Uh, we've had five days of more than 15 sessions from these nine UN entities listed on the bottom of the slide here. Um, here's the agenda if you haven't seen it already. Uh, to note that we will be sharing the recordings of all these webinars. So Johanna can put in the chat the link to the YouTube playlist where you'll be able to, to see some of the sessions. They're not all there just yet, but uh, they will be over um, shortly. So if you would like to catch up on any of these sessions, that would be the place to do it. Okay, so in terms of the logistics about today's session, uh, we ask that you put your questions in the Q&A box in the bottom of your screen. Uh, there'll be a lot of time for questions, so if you uh, have one, please put one there, put, or if you put them in there, as well as upvote those of your colleagues, so uh, we can have questions that really resonate across, across the audience today. Okay, so with that, um, I'm going to introduce our speaker for today. So we're fortunate to have with us, uh, as I said, Professor Cass Sunstein. He's the, excuse me, Sorry, as I get oriented here. <laughs> um, he's the Robert Walmsley University professor at Harvard. He's also the founder and director of the program of behavioral economics and public policy at Harvard Law School. He's engaged uh, quite a bit in practice. So he's not just an academic, <laughs> that's you know, a prolific academic at that. Uh, he's worked uh, with the World Health Organization, uh, World Bank and other international organizations. He also was the administrator in the office of um, of uh, White House's Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs from 2009 to 2012. And you might also recognize Cass from his many books. Uh, just one that's recently released is Noise, which was authored with uh, Daniel Kahneman, as well as Olivier Sumini. So there's, we'll be hearing a bit about that now, or in, in the session today. Also, Cass will be releasing a book uh, shortly called Sludge, uh, again, a topic that we'll be discussing today as well. Um, so those are some those are some recent books, but you of course he co-authored the book Nudge with uh, Richard Thaler in 2008, which has been highly influential regarding uh, the application of behavioral science, particularly in the public sector. So with that, Cass, I'll turn it over to you for uh, some remarks and reflections on sludge and noise. Over to you. Thank you so much, Mary, and it's a pleasure and an honor to get to talk to you on this historic week of the release of the guidance note from the Secretary General. Uh, which uh, promises to be transformative. Uh, I have two parts of these remarks. The first is sludge and the second is noise. So to get at sludge, here's uh, a true story. In Switzerland, a number of years ago, there was, as part of the environmental policy, an effort to promote automatic enrollment in green energy. And the question was, would this work? And the answer is very recently in, and the answer is a resounding yes, that not only households, but um, small businesses and medium-sized businesses and large businesses are using green energy much more than they did before. Now that might not startle you, but here are two things that make this a remarkable finding. First, green energy in Switzerland is more expensive than 
dirty your energy. So people are willing to incur those costs. And second, the only thing the new policy did was automatically to enroll people in green energy. It didn't impose sanctions or punishments, no economic incentives, no mandates. It was simply a reduction of sludge to be defined shortly. The second true tale is from the best named academic article of all time. It's called Everyone Believes in Religion Redemption. It is not a religious tract. It is a study of whether people are going to mail in a form in order to get redemption of a coupon from which they would get real money back. And uh, the fact is that all the data shows that people think they're going to mail in the form, but they don't. A number of nudges were used to try to get people to mail in the form, such as a reminder, mail in the form, you need to to get the money back at the right time. Or people were told people in other groups didn't mail in the form. That didn't cut their optimism, nor did it change their behavior. Only one thing worked which was to make it really easy to mail in the form, to make it very simple. That sludge reduction technique was the only thing that helped in cutting the difference between people's belief about what they were going to do and about what they would actually do. Okay, think of sludge as frictions that prevent people from getting where they want to go. It might be a friction that involves administrative burdens that have to be overcome to get economic benefits to which you're entitled. It might be waiting time that you have to endure in order to get a visa. It might be an interview requirement that's not a lot of fun and a little humiliating that you have to do in order to get a a benefit from the government. It might be paperwork requirements and forms that some lawyer wrote that the lawyer believed would be easy because the lawyer is a lawyer, but for an ordinary person is like a wall separating them from something that could change their lives. Sludge, understood as frictions of this kind, is everywhere and it often has a devastating effect on real lives. In the United States, the uh, number of paperwork hours imposed by the United States government is 11 billion. Pause over that number if you would. Every nation should do this kind of inquiry to figure out what is the paperwork burden. And 11 billion hours, or even if it's 1 billion hours, or 195 million hours, can have a harmful effect on purely rational actors who conclude I got limited time and my capacity to navigate this process is limited. I'm going to forget about it. And for human beings who are imperfectly rational actors, the power of inertia and procrastination are such as to turn sludge into something which is um, undermining, deeply undermining of a well-spirited program. If we think in particular that human beings have scarcity of cognitive attention, not only scarcity of money, but also scarcity of attention. So if we're busy or hungry or lonely or poor, we're probably thinking about other things than navigating sludge. For the people for whom programs are often designed, scarcity is a particularly challenging problem which means that the impact of sludge will be much more severe than anyone anticipated. A response to sludge is a sludge audit. There are sludge audits cropping up all over the world informally. This is very much a boat that we're building as we're sailing on it. They can be informal and qualitative. How much in the, last, in the next four weeks time are people spending? People may be at the UN. People maybe who are dealing with a government in Guatemala. How much time are they spending on those frictions once we've specified that? Or they can be formally, formal and quantitative. Often the best policy toward improving the performance of programs is to reduce sludge. And President Reagan's uh, famous words, tear down that wall, apply very much to the horrific world of sludge. Okay, that's the first part. Now we're going to talk about noise. There's been a lot of attention given to biases. 
if you get it on a scale in the morning and it always shows you as a little heavier than you actually are, that's my scale, it is a biased scale. If there's a clock or a watch that is always 10 minutes ahead, maybe because you don't want to be late for meetings and you set it that way, it is a biased clock or watch. If you have a scale that shows you as a little heavier than you are half of the time and a little lighter than you are actually half of the time, it's a noisy scale. If you have a measuring instrument that shows scatter rather than systemic bias, it is noisy. The human mind is a measuring instrument and whenever there is judgment, there is noise we find and more than you think. This is a world of hurt, I think, the world of noise, and I want to say a little bit about why. With respect to asylum systems in many countries, there's a lottery. Who is chosen to decide whether someone gets asylum? The most important moment in the asylum determination may be in the lottery that chooses the person who's going to make that decision. In many criminal justice systems, the problem is not only bias, it's noise, in the sense that someone who is convicted of an offense could get a little light sentence or a severe sentence, depending on who the judge is. Actually, it's worse than that. If a judge is in a good mood because his or her favorite sports team won the day before, the data suggests that people are going to get lighter sentences. If the judge is in a bad mood because the weather's really bad, there's suggestive evidence that the judge is going to be more severe on people. That's to suggest there's noise within the person. Each of us is noisy and there's noise across people, which is to say within systems. For interviews and promotions and foster care and visa determinations, there's a great deal of noise, meaning that similar decision makers render very different decisions either because they have different values or different moods from one another, or because the patterns that they like to see in order to be generous to people are different from the patterns other people like to see. Okay, it's intuitive to think that while bias is a big problem, noise, not so much. Bias has charisma. Bias is Taylor Swift. Bias is Elvis Presley. Bias is the star of the show. Noise is the character who at the end of the movie, maybe it's a Hitchcock movie, turns out to be the one you didn't notice who's the real killer. And the reason is that when there's a system at the UN or the World Health Organization or in Portugal or Germany that's noisy, the errors don't cancel out. They add up. If one set of authorities are too severe and another is too lenient, so on average, there's no bias. There are compounding errors. If in a firm, half of the people are too optimistic and half of the people are too pessimistic, everyone is going to be wrong, even though on average, there's no mistake at all. The problems posed by noise are unfairness, a violation of equal treatment, and also sheer mistake, which often costs a lot of money. And in the medical domain, it can reduce it, it result in terrible health come, outcomes where we've learned that some doctors are very test and hospitalization inclined and others are very go home and come back in six months inclined. Those can add up. The best response to noise is decision hygiene something which can help you against all sorts of diseases, even if you don't know what you're protecting yourself against. And I'm going to just give three examples of decision hygiene strategies that promise to reduce noise. The first is guidelines. If a guideline is in place, similarly situated decision makers are less likely to be noisy. Guidelines really help, and we can give examples. We need not guidelines everywhere, but we need guidelines in more places. The second approach is to get several different views and aggregate. And in UN processes and governmental processes generally, we need more of that. 
where if you get independent views and add them up and take the majority or the average, that's going to be error reducing, bias reducing, by the way, and also noise reducing. The third decision hygiene strategy is avoid holistic judgments. The word holistic has become a little bit sentimental and surrounded by a halo, so people like the word. I'm here to make a plea against holisticness. Holism, I don't have a view on, but holisticness I'm against. The reason holisticness is a problem is that by giving an all things considered judgment about what to do, you create a recipe for noise, both within people, is it the afternoon when they're tired or the morning when they're energetic? and across people. If you disaggregate a judgment about, let's say, whether someone gets hired or someone gets benefits into its component parts, and if you make sure each of the assessments is independent, the data suggests that we will have much less noise. Here's one way to think about it. Options should be seen as like candidates. And we know that when candidates are chosen for positions, this decision hygiene repertoire is often successful in eliminating both bias and noise. The aggregate plea is, let's say a 2021 project should be sludge reduction everywhere on the ground that sludge is often an offense not only to outcomes but to human dignity. And 2022 should be a noise reduction year. It has less glamour but we have a world of hurt to improve. Thanks. Great, thanks so much for that. There's a lot in there we could unpack, or we will unpack over the next 40 or so minutes. Um, just to bring in some of the themes we've talked about this week that you've touched upon your work. So we spoke to Richard Thaler on, on Wednesday. He, we really emphasized the idea of making it easy. So we kind of touched upon sludge in a sense, but really kind of really focusing on that. Um, as well, uh, in 2019, Elder Schiff here came to speak to us about his work on, on scarcity and cognitive load and, and so these sorts of themes that have come up previously in our discussions as well. And I think Johanna's put that, the link to that, um, at the YouTube of recording in the chat. So if anyone wants to know more about uh, the, the work of scarcity and Elder Schiff here in Central Millennium, then um, please check out the link. Um, as well as sludge audits. So we at the UN have started a, a little a pilot sludge audit. So if this is a topic that's of interest to you, um, get in touch with us and we can and start to explore because obviously sludge within the management administration of the UN is a is an issue that resonates across UN entities. So it is cross-cutting in a way that we can we can hopefully ameliorate <laughs> through the UN Variable Science Group. Um, and in terms of bias and noise, this is really interesting kind of, as you said, framing it that way. I did not expect Taylor Swift to make a reference again to this talk, but happy you're able to, to build that in. Um, and yeah, I think there's just so many implications across the UN for this, um, particularly when it comes to healthcare and there's lots we can explore. I've done, there's lots of work with them in the more behavioral science field about um, or having forms for physicians and how to make them behaviorally informed such that it's maybe easier or harder to do to get a certain test. And there's done work. I've done work previously on opioid prescribing and ensuring that you know it's appropriately done using behaviorally informed um, tools and approaches. So there's lots, there's lots there to unpack, but I'm sure in the discussion today we'll cover many more topics. Okay, so just just a question about sludge uh, that's come up a few times in our in our talks in the UN system. So particularly when it comes to violence against women and girls or intimate partner violence. Um, there's work that's being done by young women in particular and other entities with respect to bystanders and by, excuse me, bystanders. So people who witness, um, witness events or things, how can they, having them report it in a way that's um, not, not sludgy, not cumbersome, um, but also in a way that's, that's respectful as you kind of got at some of the, the, um, the terms there and you're speaking. So do you have any thoughts when it comes to this field in particular regarding sludge and, and bystanders of, of violence against women and girls or intimate partner violence? Yes. So um, there's a German psychologist from the 1930s who said, when we want to change behavior, we often think, how do we push people in the preferred direction? And he said, that's often not right. What you want to think is, why aren't they doing it anyway and remove the obstacle? So I, I have one process thought, which is uh, actually to talk to victims of domestic violence and to understand in their own words, why haven't they been reporting in cases in which they haven't? Or people have reported, ask them if they hesitated, why was that? 
and the, the, the learning is likely to be very large. The second thing is there's a, a, a suicide hotline that was created in the United States very recently. It's just a simple number. Uh, I don't know what it is offhand, but, uh, and I'm fortunate that this isn't a problem that my family faces, but many families do, and they know that number. And if, if there's a simple number you can call, and then it isn't work, it isn't humiliating, it has a kind of routine and naturalness, and that can help a lot. Administrator Power spoke earlier this week about the USAID and possibly UN-related initiative uh, about uh, bus accidents, I think, in Kenya, where there was a, a simple phrase uh, saying, speak up. And that was basically designed to give a signal, it's easy, it's, it's okay, and uh, it's, it's soft. So something that both makes it very simple and makes the any stigma that might be associated with the action uh, zero. That, that would be the direction. Great, thanks for that. And I think as we develop more work in this space, there'll be more collective understanding about, about this as well, because there isn't a lot of, of um, work that applying behavioral science in particular that we can, we can explore at this time. Um, okay, and just, just a question regarding noise. As you mentioned, uh, medicine scenario, there's could be a lot of potential here, and I know it's featured in the book, um, the chapter on it. Um, do you have any thoughts more broadly on the application of decision hygiene when it comes to the field of medicine? Yes, so in medicine, startlingly, uh, not just psychiatry where we might expect a lot of noise, but in lung cancer, endometriosis, heart disease, doctors are quite noisy. Now it's not random, but to get the same judgment from uh, two doctors uh, is often not possible. And that is uh, alarming because at least one is going to be wrong. And it might be that they're both wrong because one is very uh, relaxed, let's say, about early stage things, and another is very uh, concerned and focused on early stage things. Um, what we know from medicine is that guidelines and second opinions can be extremely helpful. And I'll give just one example, which is, I think, instructive for medicine and everywhere. Um, when a child is born in many countries, there's something called an APGAR score, where there are five things that are tested by the nurse or the doctor on a scale, I believe, of one to four, and they're added up. And if the number is above a certain number, don't worry. If the number is below a certain number, do worry. And the APGAR score has been phenomenally successful at uh, cutting bias and also cutting noise. And it's not like an algorithm or anything. It's not that rigid. There's judgment at each of the uh, numerical assignments, but it is a recipe for noise reduction. For medicine generally, we need a lot of APGAR scores in figuring out who gets visas and asylums, uh, asylum or who gets social security benefits, some uh, system that's often very noisy. We need the equivalent of APGAR scores. Fascinating. There are lots of applications there we could think about across variety of domains. So. Great. Um, I'm going to turn it over now to the audience to ask some questions for you. We have quite a few coming in. Um, so if you'd like to ask the question yourself to, to cast Professor Sunstein, um, I will give you the opportunity to. I will um, start with Yunju. Uh, would you like to ask your question? Uh, yes, I would love to. Uh, thank you so much for the fascinating events this week. And uh, my question was like, uh, within the complex UN system across agencies, uh, especially in the field office. Uh, how do you think the cost benefit analysis of the sludges can be done uh, efficiently? That was my question. Thank you very much. Okay, so um, Wittgenstein ended the tractatus with a statement of humility about not speaking about things that you don't understand. So I, I, I have glimpses into this, but I'm going to be uh, humble and, and give an example from my government. Um, one thing the Department of Homeland Security did was to ask for public comments on barriers and burdens in the immigration system. And we received 7,000 comments. 
uh, drawing attention in many cases to barriers that are much harder to overcome than was anticipated. And these are people who actually work with the system. So I would think having listened to friends, including spouse, who deal, deal with the UN, part of the UN, that there are clearance processes and bureaucratic requirements that uh, should be scrutinized to ask, are they, are they worth it? And it might be that there are five clearance processes, five clearances needed when there should be two. It might be that the forms that have to be filled out are excessively detailed. It might be that some of the forms don't need to be filled out at all. And, and this is less technical stuff than it seems because it makes it harder for people to do their jobs and sometimes blocks things that are really good. And so I would think that to scrutinize in an intuitive way here, uh, how much hours are spent on the, how many hours are spent on this stuff and what is the likely payoff? Often, if there's been a practice that's persisted for a while, people don't wanna change it by virtue of that. Um, but that's, that's a warning sign, that's a red flag. It's longevity. It's not necessarily a, uh, attributes to its wisdom. Great, thanks. Thanks for that, Cass. That's helpful. Okay, on to our, our next question. Uh, Flora from Brazil. Over to you. Would you like to? I can also read your question if you prefer. Okay. Um, so Flora's actually worked for the South, city of Sao Paulo applying, uh, applying behavioral science, so she has quite a bit of experience in this space. Um, would you say that sledge solutions need to be applied in public policies using the regular behavioral science app behavioral application cycles, so like RCT and testing, or would it be necessary um, in this case to apply behavioral science in a faster manner, so a bit kind of the methods of behavioral science application? Both but I would put in bright lights and with a sunlight around it, the second. So RCT is great if you can do testing to see what forms are best and work most efficiently, uh, excellent. But we know that some things just really don't make sense. So sometimes there's a quarterly filing requirement. It should be annual. Sometimes pre-population is, is possible and should be done. Sometimes uh, eliminating a form filling requirement is just a really good idea. Sometimes an administrative burden just on reflection is pointless. Uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has revealed for some governments the things they've been requiring for the last 25 years are really not necessary. And we shouldn't need a, a pandemic to, to clarify that. Um, there was one country that required truck drivers to fill out forms at the end of the day to make sure that the trucks are safe. And then they truck drivers would go to sleep and then they'd come back the next day and they'd have to fill out the same form again. But nothing happened to the truck overnight. And this was, there was no need for RCT. The truck drivers said, why do we have to do this? It makes no sense. The government listened and said, okay, if nothing has happened with the truck overnight, you don't have to do the form again. And uh, my, my hope is that in Brazil and many places, something like this can be replicated. That's the opposite of a replication crisis, by the way. <laughs> exactly. I think COVID-2 also just thinking more broadly about behavioral science and the themes of the week is really challenge practitioners in terms of the methods we use. We don't always use RCTs and what we do as well. We have to use surveys now, more rapid, rapid evaluation tools just broadly as well when it comes to applying behavioral science. So um, great. Um, okay, so next a question from Aswini. Could you also tell us where you're from uh, and introduce yourself? Thanks. Hello, Professor Cass. This is Ashwini from India. My question is around sustainability and I work in the development sector in Asia and Africa. So my question is, once you've in implemented the intervention, um, how do you ensure that the communities do not go back to the old way of doing things? Because I work with fish farmers and um, school teachers. And I find that after the intervention period of three years or two years ends, there is actually a process where the, the impact is declining and many of them go back to the old way of doing things. That's great, and it's great. I've been to India. I had a phenomenal visit not terribly long ago on these topics. Uh, so hi, Indian friends from India. Um, uh, what I would suggest is that it's important to distinguish across interventions in order to make progress on that. So we know that 
something like simplification or sludge reduction tends to be self-sustaining in its effects and its um, longevity. We also know that if you switch a default rule from opt-in to opt-out, or if you specify a different kind of default rule, that also tends to be persistent in its effects. So Thaler has an article uh, called When Nudges Are Forever. The original title was Nudges Are Forever. We discussed this and the, as your question suggests, when nudges for, or, or forever is more accurate. But a, a default rule tends to be highly persistent. If, if there's an intervention that involves provision of information or that involves signaling a social norm or maybe even a graphic warning, that, that might fall apart after a while. And um, to collect data, of course, is a very good thing. If you have an intervention that is falling apart, as Llewellyn, I'm sorry, Lewin, the German psychologist who suggested ask why it isn't happening anyway, that applies here. Why exactly has, is there backsliding? And that will give you a clue about what to do. If there's backsliding because the intervention got people to do something that's inconsistent with their interests and values, th that suggests you, you, need, you need either to continue with the intervention or you need to find some way to work on the interests and values. So you're asking a deep question. When, when nudges understood as choice preserving interventions fail, um, the chances are that the reason is that people don't like the direction in which they're being nudged. And that's important to know. It may be that the nudge is, is ill-suited to the context. It may be you need to nudge better. It may, might mean that you need a mandate or something. So I'll give a little example. It's one of my favorite studies. It's from the Netherlands. And it was using choice architecture to try to get people to choose healthier bread. And what was done, it was a randomized control trial. They got in a bunch of stores uh, re repositioning of the healthy bread. So it was very visible, it was easy to find and get. The less healthy bread was harder to find. And the prediction was it's just going to work, that people are going to start buying the healthier bread. The prediction completely failed. People thought, I don't want that healthy bread. It doesn't taste good. And they went and got there, the less healthy bread. It may be that what you're describing is exactly that, we need to know more, where people wanted the tasty bread. And uh, maybe you can make the healthy bread tastier, or maybe you can signal the uh, serious health consequences of eating healthy. But th th these would be the directions that might help for a better nudge or a non-nudge. Thank you. That's very helpful. And this is a topic that's come up in our discussions across the UN as well in terms of the work that we do and having the sustained impact that we hope to have instead of these sort of projects over the course of six months or a year and really kind of having that long term. So these are some very helpful considerations. Um, okay, so next on to Kangen. Uh, would you like to ask your question and tell us where you're from? Uh, hi, everyone. First of all, I would like to thank, uh, take this opportunity to thank you, uh, the UN and Professor Katz to uh, give a wonderful lecture. Uh, I belong to India. And uh, again, uh, I just had like, uh, while you were telling your last answer, I was just wondering, did that decrease the sales of uh, the breads? Like, because uh, people are not ready to <laughs> buy the unhealthy uh, healthy ones? As I recall the study, no, people just went and found the, um, the healthy bread. It wasn't that hard to find it, but your prediction undoubtedly could be vindicated in other circumstances. So there, there are studies that try to nudge people in directions that might lead to comparatively greater choice of the thing that is sought compared to before the intervention, but the aggregate choice of the relevant thing decreases. So there are cases like what you described. I mean, the okay, so let's talk a little bit about kind of both theory and practice. It, it might be that if people are encouraged to do X rather than Y or nudged, um, that will persist because they learn that X is really good. So they might find, I'm just gonna randomly say, vegetables taste better than they thought. Or they might um, 
learned that vegetables are healthy and that really matters. Or they might just develop a habit and, and that persists even though they don't love the thing particularly more, it's just habitual. So that's one set of things. Uh, there are other contexts, and these are the easiest ones, where the nudge leads people in a direction that they wanted before the fact, but had a hard time getting to, or that they learn after the fact is really good. So if you're doing something, let's say saving energy, it might be that you kind of want to do that, but you didn't know exactly how, or it might be there's some benefit that a private or public organization is offering that you really want, but there was sludge in the way. And then if the sludge is taken away, there will be really persistent uh, take up of the thing because it's something that people want. So maybe we distinguish between cases in which people are being eased to get what they want or ease to get what after the fact they really are glad they have. That's like um, a GPS device. Let's say that's the model. Or cases in which people are being nudged, not through sludge reduction, but through a behavioral intervention to do something which is in their interest, but which they don't like. And that one is going to be harder. A default rule might well work because even though they don't love it so much, if they don't care a whole lot, they're not going to take the trouble to change it. That, that makes perfect sense. Uh, my actually gen, uh, earlier question was more about uh, when it comes to incentivization, there are times it may backfire. For example, what's happening in Philadelphia as of now, they say uh, for vaccines, they're saying you'll get a million dollars lottery if you get vaccinated. So do, when, when incentivization actually backfires, do we term that as sludge? And how do we ensure that we are not sludging people and we are actually nudging people to do the right thing? Okay, that's great. So the backfire effect uh, has been found very rarely. Uh, the, so there are three categories. There's the successful nudge, the successful sludge, sludge reduction, there's the uh, unsuccessful in the sense that you don't change the world at all. That's the Netherlands study. And then there's the backfire effect. The latter two are really interesting and occasionally very important, but they're rare. So the data is suggests the first category is much larger. That may just because smart people have produced behaviorally informed strategies and we could imagine a place that's just blundering and so the second two categories are larger but i, I wouldn't worry unduly about them but th i would worry they're important okay if, if you have a case of a backfire effect and I'm, I'm not aware of the data from philadelphia but i can give some speculation there there are two reasons why you might have a backfire effect one is it might be that if people are automatically enrolled, let's say as organ donors, my understanding is this is the Netherlands experience, then there is salience to that fact, which triggers um, some sort of um, judgment about whether they really want that. And the judgment is negative. So it might be that there's a cascade of opt-outs that happens because people are now focusing on the thing and they say, I don't want to be an organ donor. The second case, which might be the Philadelphia case, if the data is as you describe it, is the extremely interesting category of reactants, where if I tell my son who's 12 years old to do something, he might not do it for one reason. I told him to do it. <laughs> so to, to be nudged or to be mandated at some times and places will produce an independent assertion of no, with an exclamation point, not because you don't like the idea, but because you've been told to do something or even nudged. So it might be that uh, in some circumstances, vaccine um, incentives are counterproductive with some population because you get this thing called reactance. So it's, it's worth remembering reactance as a possible behavioral response to a behaviorally informed intervention. And we all should know about reactance. The beauty of sludge reduction is that it won't fuel reactance. People are most unlikely to say, 
give me a 20 page form rather than a two page form that doesn't make them angry. It's very helpful. Thank you for that, Asmini, and for your comments, Kath, on the reactants. I think we're, we're all noting that down as we think about application of behavioral science and sludge. Okay, on to our next, sorry, trying to go through as many as we can here. On to our next question, uh, Vera, who's also from Brazil. Please come in. Hi, great talk as usual. Thank you very much. Uh, I was wondering if you'd have any tips on how to change guidelines that you mentioned before into simpler checklists, which are a lot easier too. Many thanks. That's so great. Thank you for that. So I'll give, give you an example from my own experience. Uh, whenever a government agency uh, in the United States issues an expensive regulation, it has to produce something called a regulatory impact analysis. Uh, there's a circular called A4, which is guidance on how to do a regulatory impact analysis. It's over 50 pages and it's really complicated. A lot of government officials struggle, especially if it's their first three years, to figure out what they're supposed to do exactly. So I thought we should have a checklist, which would be one page and which would say, here's what you do. If you look up regulatory impact analysis checklist, I wouldn't encourage that because you have more important things to do, but if you do, you will find it. And it's just one page. It distills a 50 page document down to one page. I'll tell you a little story, which is in the White House. There was concern about the checklist, which is that uh, it could create a political uh, controversy where unfriendly politicians would say, did you do what the checklist said? Or where the newspapers would say, did you do what the checklist said? And I thought that's a wonderful thing that would hold government to account to do what it's supposed to do, but not everyone thought that. So there was an internal debate in which um, uh, some of us thought if we can't get a checklist through, then the world is surreal. And that, uh, that incredulity ultimately worked. So I, I love your idea of having checklists in any circumstance in which you have something complicated. And there's a book called The Checklist Manifesto, which has a lot of data on their importance. And a checklist can be um, a nudge and it can reduce noise, by the way, in medicine. A checklist is a little bit of that disaggregating of holistic judgments, and it can be a sludge buster. So if people say, okay, so uh, we have something in the United States, forgive my parochial examples, you have to get something called a real ID. Um, it's a more secure ID. So uh, the, the ID allows you to travel because we know there's no fraud, much less likely fraud. How do you get a real ID? It's complicated. There's a checklist. It has three items on it. And that three item checklist is, uh, if not a godsend, a blessing. Yeah, I can definitely see that. And all these, these complicated processes can actually boil down to sometimes these three steps if, if you're just given the right information in the right place in the right time. And um, another thing we've spoken about previously is the idea of implementation intentions. So not only what are the things you should do, but how should you go about those if you were, when you go about certain activities. So. Um, there's lots we can explore when it comes to checklists and, and, and behaviors as we continue our discussions across the UN. So thank you very much for your question, Vera. Um, okay, so next on to an anonymous attendee. I don't know if you would like to ask your question yourself. I could, I could read it. Um, it's regarding jobs that depend on sludgy processes. Okay, I can, I can ask myself. So often people feel like their jobs depend on sludgy processes. Uh, how can we convince them to support doing away with sludge, even though this may at the same time reduce the need for their job? Well, um, maybe they'd like another job better, or maybe they'd like their own job better if it didn't involve sludge. So uh, that's too quick an answer. It, it may be there are cases where there's going to be internal resistance because people think that their job depends on uh, sludge stuff. And then you need uh, an authority who is going to say, we're just gonna reduce this. 
And an authority might say that, thinking if you can make the UN much more efficient, then the resources that it needs can be reallocated to places where um, they're more needed. If there's a particular person who has authority who is whose job is dependent on sludge, um, the the task would be to get that person excited and have ownership of something else. The, the, there were a number of years ago these jokes called light bulb jokes. They weren't funny about how many lawyers does it take to change a light bulb, how many doctors does it change a light bulb. There was only one think that is funny and relevant to the question, which is how many psychiatrists does it take to change a light bulb? The answer is one, but the light bulb has to want to change. And so the all of us find this, I'm in government now, that if there's someone who is uh, reluctant for reason of principle or self-interest, uh, to connect that with something that that person actually really cares about. And maybe that at a more abstract level, the sludge reduction idea is, is part of that person's self-understanding, which is about efficiency or service. Well, it's really interesting about that. Yeah, how we can think about uh, reframing sludge into something that's more meaningful, reducing sludge reduction to more meaningful to individuals within the system. Great, so on to Natalie, who I believe is from the UN. Would you like to ask your question to Professor Sunstein? Uh, yes, um, good uh, afternoon, Professor. Um, so I, I'm Natalie, I'm from, uh, I'm in Cambodia, so it's evening here. I am a lawyer, actually, you were talking about the jokes about lawyers, I'm a, one of them, and I actually work at the UN uh, Assistance for the Khmer Rouge trial, so we are prosecuting uh, very bad guys here. Um, and I have a question for you uh, regarding um, what is your main response, or maybe the most effective one, to people who reject the application of behavioral insights? Because for them, it looks very much like manipulation, paternalistic interventions. I'm thinking about that because if we are to mainstream the, the use of behavioral science in, uh, in the UN, we'll have some complicated discussions with colleagues who don't necessarily understand or um, are interested in, in this. Thank you. Thanks. It's a great question. So I think the, the way to deal with that concern, and it's an important concern, is to get very specific. So if people are given information about the side effects of medicine in a way that's very concrete, so it says if you have heart disease or diabetes, uh, don't take this medicine, that's not manipulative. If people are given clarity that, that if they go to the grocery store and buy certain foods, there are allergens in them, that's not manipulation. If people are given text reminders that a bill is due or a doctor's appointment is, is coming, that's, please don't miss it or cancel it if you want to, that, that's not manipulation. So there's an assortment of behaviorally informed interventions, which would be preposterous, crazy to call them manipulative. They're educative. And so if anything, they're the opposite of manipulative. Sludge reduction as a behavioral informed intervention, if you take a 10 page form and make it a half page form, or if you dispense with an interview requirement because people are old or sick or because they're scared of COVID, that, that's not manipulative. If you make something easy that was hard by taking away an obstacle, that isn't manipulative. So the, 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 I, I confess I struggle to think of any behaviorally informed interventions that are justly called manipulative. Can we think of one? Uh, the answer isn't no, we can't think of one, but we have to work at it. Now, there are behaviorally informed interventions that shift from an opt-in to opt-out design so that poor children might be automatically enrolled in some programs that give them, let's say, food for free. Is that manipulative? I think it would be a little wild to say that's manipulative. If people are automatically enrolled in a savings plan that's in their interest, subject to easy opt out, is that manipulative? That's when my dog is saying no with her bark. Uh, I, I think it's very hard to say that's manipulative. Is a graphic warning for cigarettes manipulative? Maybe, maybe. 
is that something that we should rule off the table, a graphic warning for cigarettes? I don't think so if it's going to save lives and give people clarity about the health risks associated with smoking. So the question is, the concern is completely fair and actually really important. Uh, we don't want government manipulating people, but can we think of five behaviorally informed interventions that are manipulative? If we can, good for us, and let's probably not do them. Let's do the ones that aren't manipulative. Sorry, can I just uh, uh, answer your question? I, I No, I cannot think of any uh, behaviorally inspired uh, intervention that could be you know, just labeled straight as manipulation. But as we are to implement um, this new approach, in works that are you know related to human rights um that uh and human rights are often uh, hinge upon you know culture differences um hinge upon uh, our moral values and you know uh things that are very subjective some people will uh, consider some items as uh, some some project interventions or tools as being manipulative so i'm just thinking of you know if we talk about um, human rights that are you know, complicated, um, for instance, freedom of speech or, um, or, or religious rights. If we, are, we start in, using these tools in, in these areas, I'm just thinking ahead of, you know, what could, um, yeah, I, I'm just thinking perhaps there could be uh, some interventions that people would see as going too far. Great, thank you. And I, I agree with that. So if you automatically enrolled people in one political party, subject to opt out, that would be in many nations a violation of a, a freedom. If you assumed that everyone is a certain religious view, unless they opted out, that would violate what some nations consider an obligation of religious neutrality. So completely agree. Um, we need a Bill of Rights for nudging, I think, which would, um, and a Bill of Rights for behaviorally informed intervention. There's a lot of work, good work by Liam Delaney and others on ethical restrictions on behaviorally informed interventions. And th these, these are really important. And you're putting your finger on the most important of all, which is if there are constitutional rights or human rights, they would apply to behaviorally informed interventions as to behaviorally uninformed interventions. Insofar as we're talking about sludge reduction, it's, it's, we could maybe, if we're very imaginative, think of cases where sludge reduction would be a violation of human rights, but we'd, ha we'd have to work at it. And if we're thinking about educative nudges as a violation of human rights, we'd, we'd also have to work at it. What, what would it be if you tell people something that is truthful, let's say, but designed to encourage them not to exercise their right to free speech, that's not very good. That would, you know, that you could nudge people to be quiet about their political convictions, that, that, that would be violative. But the, the good thing about some behaviorally informed interventions, not all, is that they are freedom preserving on principle. So if we're worried about rights violations, and I'm conscious of prosecuting uh, Kaima Rouge, the, it, it's, it's not warnings and you know, easy opt-out default rules that are the, the things we'd single out as the violation of human rights, though some warnings are violations of human rights. Right. Thank you for that, Cass, and thank you for your question as well, Natalie. That's really helpful. I think ethics is something we've discussed quite a bit in the UN system of very and different opinions and something that we are working on as well, thinking about the UN context and what we can do here to think about whether it's Bill of Rights or just some, some, some thinking with respect to ethics and the context in which we work. Um, Cass, can you stay? Sorry, go ahead. No, to the response to this great question, I've been involved in a 17 nation survey of what people think of behaviorally informed interventions. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it involves China and Russia and Germany and Denmark and Canada, many nations. And, the, and the, you can elicit from the data a kind of cross-cultural understanding 
of what's okay and what's not okay. And to understand that as an input into the question asked about what's a right, rights violation is, uh, I think, reasonable. Meaning, what, do, what does humanity think? And there's not consensus across countries, but there's much more than I expected about which behavioral interventions are acceptable and which aren't. Interesting. Well, we could check that out. Maybe we can move on and we can hopefully track that down and put that in the chat. I think I've, I've seen it previously. Um, great. Okay. Can you stay with us a few minutes, Cass? Be on the hour. You need to leave. Okay. Um, so next, uh, we can go to Chitra. Could you please um, ask your question? Thank you very much to UN for this uh, really awesome session. And thank you so much, uh, Professor Sunstein, for this, um, for, for the earlier um, talk at the lecture as well. It was really amazing. Um, so I'm with uh, WF Malaysia. I work um, with a lot of the, um, on the areas of ocean sustainability. And so recently we started a project with a group of um, um, you know, um, ocean farmers, fish farmers, um, in Malaysia and looking at how we can get them to become more sustainable in the farming because we understand that you know the protein demand is growing and wild fish is you know heavily depleted so aquaculture seems to be a solution to a lot of these challenges that we're facing in feeding um, the world and um, so when we started looking at that of course there are many um, angles that we come um, you know when we talk to this um, community as well and so the, we were looking at some of the motivations and values and also a lot of their barriers um, to it, adopting sustainability. And sometimes the barriers was much larger. So for example, for them, access to finance was one of the biggest barriers. So without funds, I mean, it's just impossible for them to adopt anything sustainable, sustainable because everything costs um, you know, money for them to, to do it. And so we, we said, okay, this is where we need to really um, design our, our, our project to, to get them you know, better, financial access so that they can become more sustainable. So having said that, so that, that sort of you know, got, got me thinking on, on when we start thinking about behavior change and also talking about how we sustain it beyond a project period is do we start prioritizing sludge and noise reduction um, as opposed to looking at maybe things like motivations and values and, and looking more from a nudging them from a more positive um, aspect. Thank you. Thanks for that and thanks for your work. Um, so I, I guess I think that, that we have a toolbox. So in some cases, people need resources, they need money. And it sounds like in your context, that is a big problem. In some cases, there's insufficient take up of programs that are you know, really valuable. And the reason there's insufficient take up is that there's sludge. And, and there you reduce the sludge. In other cases, it might be that people's values are inconsistent with the uh, new direction. And then the, uh, you know, the, the indicated tool in the toolbox is, is to work with or on social norms. So it might be that there is a social norm that is already in play that is compatible with the new direction that can be made salient, or it might be that there's an emerging social norm, if that's true, it's minority still, but it's coming. And that if people are given clarity that it is coming, and if that's truthful, that can increase behavior. So I'll give two examples of, of the, I have in mind the second, I'm gonna to try to think of one for the one I had before. So uh, there's data suggesting with respect to sustainability, if people think that people are increasingly engaged in sustainable behavior, even though it's not the majority, you create a, a greater likelihood that people will do it. So people appear not to be, uh, want to be on the wrong side of history. And if they learn that people are increasingly doing something sustainable, then they have a kind of proof of concept or possibility. So that's one approach. To your point about values and identity, if you get people who have the values and identity of the people who think their values and, and identity are inconsistent with the proposed course of action, and they can be prominently saying, this is the thing to do, I'm doing it and I'm like you and it's great, that can be very helpful. So I love your question because there's a, a kind of behavioral concept which is just being born as we speak, which is something like identity-based cognition 
where your view about what you should think and do is based on your conception of your identity rather than engagement with some technology or new process. And then to work with that or to work on that can be productive. All right, thanks for that, Cass. And I see just Johanna's put, in, or someone's put in the chat, Liam Delaney's work on um, uh, the reference to the living library that he's created, but there's also his for good framework, which looks at some of the ethics here. So I just wanted to share that as well. Um, so I know we're over time, but I wanted to take the, the privilege and as moderator here to ask you one last question. Um, so on Monday, we launched the UN Secretary General's guidance note on the application of behavioral science. Um, where would you like to see the UN go with this a year from now or months from now? Or what, what are your thoughts on that overall? So there's low hanging fruit and then there's higher hanging fruit. Uh, low hanging fruit, I'd like a sustained process of sludge reduction, both internally at the UN and, UN and working with partner nations with respect to programs that promise to help people whose promise is undermined by virtue of the existence of sludge. So I'm learning in my own government experience right now, as I did before, that this is something that really is feasible. The second thing I'd be so inspired to see is that in three substantive areas, call them domestic violence, sustainability, and poverty reduction, uh, real work is done with respect to behavioral science to help at least some percentage of people turn their lives around. And to, to see that happening sooner rather than later would be a phenomenal achievement and give a kind of momentum to the much more that we need to see uh, in the pretty near future. Great, thanks for that. I made notes there in terms of where we go from here. Um, just to flag as well, these are topics that came out in the UN Behavioral Science Report of gender, uh, domestic, uh, intimate partner violence, uh, climate change, um, poverty reduction. These are the areas where the UN has done work, but also sees potential for more in the space. So very much, very happy to see that aligns and um, where is we'll be exploring concretely in the future. So thank you very much, Cass. I, I, I want to close out here, but would you like to say anything, anything in conclusion before I I'd just like to give a standing ovation there to you and your leadership and Johanna to you and your leadership. You've really done something that is uh, historic is uh, I think an, an understatement. It's a, a, a phenomenal development in world history and a salute to the two of you in particular and also to all of you who are on the call for your amazing work. All right. Thank you so much, Kaz. That's, that means a lot coming from you. And you've obviously played a role in all of the, all of our efforts as well. And um, so thank you for all your work too. And I um, want to acknowledge as well the support from the executive office of the Secretary General who helps us do all this. It's not just Johanna and I. So there are many people behind all of these efforts. So thank you very much. Um, okay. So with that, uh, we will no doubt hear from you some other time in our, in our webinars here at the UN. Thank you very much for your, your insights today. We will take a lot when it comes to sludge, when it comes to noise and, and bias and really thinking about how we frame these issues differently. And with that, thank you very much and we'll speak to you soon. Bye everyone.